Welcome to Iron Sharpens Iron. My name is Jeremy Nettles. I am the evangelist for the River Ridge Church of Christ. It meets in Newburgh, Indiana. If you would like to stop by and visit us for our 9 a.m. Sunday morning Bible study or 10 a.m. worship, you can find us at 5600 Van Road in Newburgh. We also gather at 4 p.m. on Sundays, and then there's a Wednesday night Bible study at 7. You're also welcome to reach out to us over the phone at 812-550-6234, or you can send an email to info at riverridgechurch.org. And those are great ways to request an appointment for a study with either me or another of our members. We'd be glad to help you uh, to find answers in God's Word for the questions that you might have about His will. You can also use those avenues to sign up for our correspondence course if you live farther away. I will send those out in the mail to you, and then you can send them back, and we'll correspond back and forth like that and go through a series of, of six lessons that give a pretty good overview of the Bible and what God expects of us in this world today. Of course, we offer that free of charge, as with all of the resources that we provide. You can also find our website, which is just riverridgechurch.org. And on there, there are lots of articles and links to other resources that you might find helpful, including links to our weekly live-streamed worship periods. If you live farther away, or perhaps if you are shut in due to coronavirus or something else, you're welcome to find those links, and then you can join with us on Sunday mornings or Sunday evenings and even Wednesday evenings for all the times that we meet. All of those things are live streamed over YouTube. You can also find our YouTube channel. Just go to youtube.com slash River Ridge Church of Christ. We'd appreciate it if you would subscribe to that, and then you'll get notified of uh, the, all the new videos that come out. Those include both these TV programs once they have been uh, aired, but there's also lots of other material, including a few shorter videos and also our backlog of uh, live streamed worship services, including sermons by me and many others as well. We also have a radio show every Sunday afternoon at 2 p.m. on 98.5 FM, and that's also on 1400 AM if you're a little bit farther out from the Evansville area. And we would welcome you to get in touch with us for questions or topic suggestions for that avenue or for this TV program or for anything else. We'd be happy to help. Please don't hesitate to reach out to us. We have been doing a series of overviews of the Bible. We're looking at the Bible as a whole, and then we've gotten progressively narrower in our focus until we finally looked at Genesis, and then most recently, just last week, we looked at Matthew's Gospel. And so we saw through that what the Apostle Matthew had to tell us about Jesus, and how that was not so much different, but more in some ways than what Mark or Luke or John have to tell us. And of course, those three have their own special perspective that they put on the story of the gospel as well. Today, we are backing up from that and hopping over to the Old Testament again. And we are going to be looking at the book of Joshua. This is the first one in the, the set of 12 that we generally call history in the Old Testament. We're going to give it just a brief look. Of course, we don't have time to read the whole thing or even a very significant chunk of it. But in the course of our overview, we're going to discover some things that people tend to miss when they're looking at Joshua. And then finally, we will use those as an indicator of some things that we need to learn today. So what do you remember about this book called Joshua? What happens in this book? I've said already that it is a history and if you know your Old Testament history and you know anything about Joshua the man, and perhaps if you know a little bit about the book that bears his name, then you probably know that it has to do with Israel's conquest of the promised land. And so while you might remember nothing of the details, there's a chance that you remember at least a little bit. You probably have a couple of things that stand out in your mind, such as perhaps Jericho. And you might remember something about Rahab the harlot that goes along with that story. You might remember, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. That's also a good thing to take away from this book. One of those, Jericho and Rahab, that happens at the very beginning of Joshua. The other one is at the very end of Joshua. But there's a pretty big chunk of text in the middle there that we don't often give so much attention Perhaps it shouldn't be too big of a surprise that we are missing out on a few things in that middle portion. In fact, there is much, much more to the story of Joshua than just Jericho and, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Let's do a rundown with some particularly good sort of summary readings. 
In chapter 1, we find Joshua being put in charge. And let's read verses 7 through 9. God tells Joshua, Only be strong and very courageous, being careful to do according to all the law that Moses my servant commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may have good success wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened and do not be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Well, that was uplifting, but why is it necessary for God to tell him all of these things? Well, of course, if you go back a page and see what happened at the end of Deuteronomy, Moses has just died. The Israelites have followed Moses in the wilderness for 40 years, and suddenly they are left without a leader. It's not entirely true. Moses had appointed Joshua to be his replacement on God's word even before he died. But nevertheless, there's a period of adjustment while they get used to the new kid on the block, even though Joshua isn't exactly a spring chicken himself. In chapter 2, we find Rahab the prostitute who hides the spies that Israel had sent in to scout out the city of Jericho. Let's read verses 8 through 14 in chapter 2. Before the men lay down, she came up to them on the roof and said to the men, I know that the Lord has given you the land, and that the fear of you has fallen upon us, and that all the inhabitants of the land melt away before you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt, and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan, to Sihon and Og, whom you devoted to destruction. And as soon as we heard it, our hearts melted, and there was no spirit left in any man because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in the heavens above and on the earth beneath." Now then, please swear to me by the Lord that, as I have dealt kindly with you, you also will deal kindly with my father's house and give me a sure sign that you will save alive my father and mother, my brothers and sisters, and all who belong to them, and deliver our lives from death. And the men said to her, Our life for yours, even to death. If you do not tell this business of ours, then when the Lord gives us the land, we will deal kindly and faithfully with you. Right after that, the spies escape, and then the Israelites come and destroy the city. And, well, that's not entirely true, is it? There is the small matter of crossing the Jordan River beforehand. They have to cross this river in order to make it to Jericho, in order to enter the promised land. And God does for them, in chapter 3 of Joshua, basically the same thing that he had done back in Exodus chapters 14 and 15, when he parted the waters of the Red Sea for them to walk through on dry ground in order to sort of enter the next phase of their journey. This has some modern parallels in baptism, and Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 that this was pretty much intended all along. But it's not so easy to just put that to bed and move on like nothing happened. They have just witnessed a great miracle, and this is the new generation. Remember, their fathers had witnessed God parting the Red Sea. Their fathers had gone through the Red Sea on dry ground, but then they had rebelled and they died out in the wilderness. It's their children who are now crossing the Jordan into the promised land. And so God sends them through a very similar sort of initiation ritual almost, some symbolic act that they can remember for the rest of their lives as beginning their walk with God in this new place, this new beginning of entering into the promised land, the promised rest. So, in chapter 4, they commemorate what has just happened. They create a memorial out of stones that they took from well, the midst of the Jordan River as they crossed. Let's read verses 21 through 24 of chapter 4. And he, that's Joshua, said to the people of Israel, When your children ask their fathers in times to come, what do these stones mean? Then you shall let your children know. Israel passed over this Jordan on dry ground. For the Lord your God dried up the waters of the Jordan for you until you passed over, as the Lord your God did to the Red Sea, which he dried up until we passed over, so that all the peoples of the earth may know that the hand of the Lord is mighty, that you may fear the Lord your God forever. Okay, so after that, then they, of course, go and destroy Jericho, but eh, no, not, not quite yet. In chapter 5, there's something else that has to happen. Apparently, while they were in the wilderness doing their 40 years of wandering, they became a little bit lax on the matter of abiding by the laws and regulations with regard to circumcision. 
This also coincided with the observation of the Passover feast. And so they knock out two birds with one stone. It's in a way three, because not only is it the Passover, which they are required to observe, but it's their first Passover in the new land that God had promised to give to them. And the manna ceased the day after they ate of the produce of the land, and there was no longer manna for the people of Israel, but they ate of the fruit of the land of Canaan that year. So, as I said, new beginning, they've crossed over the river into the promised land, the promised rest, and after they have observed this first Passover feast, God cuts off their supply of bread from heaven, of the manna that he fed them with in the wilderness. In chapter 6, they finally attack Jericho. God tells them to march around the city once a day for six days, and then on the seventh day to march around the city seven times. That sounds uh, exhausting and perhaps impossible until you realize that the city of Jericho, while it was a big city at that time and for that place, really more of a village by our standards. Verses 20 and 21. So the people shouted and the trumpets were blown. As soon as the people heard the sound of the trumpet, the people shouted a great shout and the wall fell down flat so that the people went up into the city, every man straight before him, and they captured the city. Then they devoted all in the city to destruction, both men and women, young and old, oxen, sheep, and donkeys, with the edge of the sword. In chapter 7, they go for the next little town. It's a much smaller one called Ai. And even though they've just conquered Jericho in such spectacular fashion without a single casualty, they fail to conquer this little city. Why? Well, because one of their ranks had failed to obey God's instructions. He told them to devote everything in the city of Jericho to destruction, which means destroy it. There were some things that were to be taken for God specifically, but everything else was to be completely destroyed. And there was a particular man named Ahan who disobeyed. And so God refused to help them conquer this next town if they were going to disregard his instructions. Well, eventually they root out the problem. They discover that this man is responsible. He is punished, cut off from the people. We could use a lot of euphemisms, but they killed him. And after that, God was totally happy to be with them, and they were able to conquer the city of Ai very easily in chapter 8. In chapter 9, there is another group of people called the Gibeonites, who, much like the people of Jericho, are absolutely terrified of the Israelites. They know that Israel is coming. They know that God is with them. They know that they are going to be destroyed. So they decide, rather than waiting around to be conquered, they're going to preemptively go and see the Israelites, and they're going to lie to them. They claim to be from much farther away than they really are, not within the borders of the Israelites' promised land, and they say that they want to build an alliance. They're pretty involved in the ruse that they have uh, constructed against the Israelites. Let's read verses 13 through 15. These wineskins were new when we filled them, and behold, they have burst. And these garments and sandals of ours are worn out from the very long journey. So the men took some of their provisions, but did not ask counsel from the Lord. And Joshua made peace with them, and made a covenant with them, to let them live. And the leaders of the congregation swore to them. Oops. God had instructed them to wipe out, to drive out these nations that were living in the promised land. And here they are just taking these people at their word, not realizing that, you know, an awful lot of people have a pretty good impetus to lie to us right now. They don't take counsel from God, and they, well, they live to pay the penalty. They're stuck with these people for good. Okay, well, having learned that lesson in chapter 10, they are going at it with a vengeance, and there is a group of five kings that decide they are going to collect their forces and fight against the Israelites together in hopes of being able to drive them off. And Joshua leads the armies of Israel against them, but they are running out of time in the day, and this is the fabled passage where the sun stands still in the sky long enough for the Israelites to conquer their enemy in battle. In the rest of chapter 10 and going on into chapter 11, they continue to conquer the promised land. In chapter 10, it's the southern portion. In chapter 11, it's off to the north. In chapter 12, there is a long list of the kings that they have conquered. In chapter 13, we get a view of the lands that remain unconquered by the time Joshua has begun to allot 
these different portions of land to the various tribes. That's the topic of chapter 14, of course, the allotments of this land of promise that God has given to them. In chapter 15, we switch things up a little bit and we have more more allotments of the land, actually. It's, it's exactly the same, just with the different tribes. In chapter 16, we see uh, more land allotments. And then by the time we get to chapter 17, we have still other uh, land allotments. Chapter 18 has even more land allotments. Chapter 19 has still more land allotments. Chapter 20, surprising no one, covers land allotments. And chapter 21, well, that one covers land allotments as well. This passage wraps up with chapter 21, verses 43 through 45. Let's read those. Thus the Lord gave to Israel all the land that he swore to give to their fathers, and they took possession of it, and they settled there. And the Lord gave them rest on every side, just as he had sworn to their fathers. Not one of all their enemies had withstood them, for the Lord had given all their enemies into their hands. Not one word of all the good promises that the Lord had made to the house of Israel had failed. All came to pass. Gad and Reuben and half of the tribe of Manasseh had decided to take their inheritance on the east side of the Jordan River, and in chapter 22 is recorded their return back to the east side, and they make some efforts to uh, put, put together a monument to make sure that they don't forget and that the Israelites on the west bank don't forget that they are still a part of the same nation, even though they're separated by this very obvious natural border in the Jordan River. Chapter 23 begins, A long time afterward, when the Lord had given rest to Israel from all their surrounding enemies, and Joshua was old and well advanced in years, Joshua summoned all Israel, its elders and heads, its judges and officers, and said to them, I am now old and well advanced in years, and you have seen all that the Lord your God has done to all these nations for your sake, for it is the Lord your God who has fought for you. This is the beginning of a rather long farewell address from Joshua. Chapter 23 covers part one of this, and then chapter 24 is part two, basically. This contains the iconic, the legendary, the super fantastic passage about, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Let's read that. Now, therefore, fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness. Put away the gods that your fathers served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. And if it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your fathers served in the region beyond the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So, what stands out to you about the book of Joshua? There is a, a lot of focus on who gets what land. There were nine chapters of that out of 24 total in the book you might call that significant. The allotment of the land got far more attention than Joshua taking the reins, or Rahab protecting the spies, or the fall of Jericho, or any such thing, or even all of those things combined. Yet, even though this covers vastly more than you know, Joshua's speech at the end of the book as well, when I asked what you remember about Joshua, you probably didn't think about the allotments of the land. Why? Why should that be? Clearly, it is important, even if we don't think that it is. So let's go back to chapter 14 and read down through chapter 21. I'm kidding. But isn't that kind of a scary thought? It's maybe a little alarming. Why don't we want to extend the effort to read all of that. I don't think it's purely out of laziness. I think it's that we are trying to maximize our reward while minimizing our efforts. And so I suppose there's a little bit of laziness involved, but it's not just that we don't want to work. It's that if we're going to work on something like that, we want for there to be a great reward that comes out of it. And realistically, we don't expect that there's going to be much reward for reading all of that. From there, it passes along on the east toward the sunrise to gath Hefer to eth Kazin, and going on to Ramon, it bends toward Neah. Then on the north, the boundary turns about to Hanathon, and it ends at the valley of Iftahel. And Kataf, Nahalal, Shimron, Idala, and Bethlehem, twelve cities with their villages. This is the inheritance of the people of Zebulun according to their clans, these cities with their villages. Nine chapters of that 
that's very, very boring. It doesn't seem like there's a whole lot of value that we can really learn out of that sort of thing. But if we're never willing to even give it a look, well, then that's going to be a self-fulfilling prophecy, isn't it? There really are things to learn from even that. God thought it was important enough to include a list like that in his scriptures. Let's treat it as such. But it's not just the allotment of the land. There are many things that are forgotten about the book of Joshua. For example, the memorial at the Jordan River, which we discovered in chapter 4. We don't often think a lot about that. There's also the first Passover observed in the land of Israel. Why is that not a bigger deal? There's the attempt at fancy strategery going on when they attack the city of Ai. We blow right past that. There's the keeping of the instructions at Mount Ebal and Gerizim according to what they had been told in Deuteronomy. We didn't even mention that, but we find it uh, toward the end of chapter 8. There are lots of giants defeated. That's one of the things that scared the, this generation's fathers away from going in to conquer the land when God told them to do so in the first place. God's promise is kept regarding Caleb's inheritance and allotment of land. Joshua and Caleb are the only members of that previous generation who were allowed to enter into the promised land, and Caleb got his inheritance just as it was promised, and Joshua also got his inheritance as it was promised. In chapter 22, when the two and a half tribes on the east bank of the Jordan go back, there is actually more to it than just they went home and then built a memorial. There was a possible civil war brewing, and it was averted. Maybe we could learn a thing or two about that in the present day and age. Of course, there is the firm resolution to remain faithful to the Lord, which we found at the end of chapter 24. And then again, the keeping of the promise to Joseph to bury his bones in the promised land. So a lot of accomplishments, a lot of promises kept. And then there are also some forgotten failures. Like how the Israelites had failed to circumcise their children for 40 years like the sin of Achan, when he took something from the fall of Jericho and ended up causing casualties and deaths on Israel's side as a result of his greed. They made a major mistake in uh, taking the Gibeonites at their word and not checking before making an alliance. They failed to drive out the Geshurites and the Machathites from the land east of the Jordan. They failed to drive out the Jebusites from an area within Judah's allotted territory. They failed to drive out all of the Canaanites from Ephraim's allotted territory. They failed to drive out all of the Canaanites from Manasseh's allotted territory. You might be noticing a little bit of a theme here. So there's a list of accomplishments and there's a list of failures, and there are things that we can learn from both the accomplishments and the failures. It's not really the purpose of today's program, though, to examine each one of those, but I hope that I have at least piqued your interest and given you enough to go on with several of these that you can see how this book is still relevant to us and still teaches us things today. As a matter of fact, we're not all that different from the Israelites in this time. Just like they had past mistakes that they needed to clean up, you've got past mistakes that are going to stick with you. They're going to haunt you probably for the rest of your life. And if you don't think that you have any past mistakes that are haunting you, look harder, or just you wait, or perhaps both. You also might have a list of forgotten successes, and the same applies there. If you can't see anything that you have done successfully in the course of your life, then first of all, look harder, because I'm sure there is something. And second of all, just you wait. And also, just like the Israelites, I'm sure you are left with incomplete tasks, things that God expects you to do, or perhaps even your own commitments for what you're going to do, that are as yet unfulfilled. What is the overall outlook that we find in the book of Joshua? Then the people answered, Far be it from us that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. For it is the Lord our God who brought us and our fathers up from the land of Egypt out of the house of slavery, and who did those great signs in our sight, and preserved us in all the way that we went, and among all the peoples through whom we passed. And the Lord drove out before us all the peoples, the Amorites who lived in the land. Therefore we also will serve the Lord, for he is our God. But Joshua said to the people, You are not able to serve the Lord, for he is a holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your transgressions or your sins. If you forsake the Lord and serve foreign gods, then he will turn and do you harm and consume you after having done you good. And the people said to Joshua, No, but we will serve the Lord. Then Joshua said to the people, You are witnesses against yourself that you have chosen the Lord to serve him. 
And they said, We are witnesses. He said, Then put away the foreign gods that are among you, and incline your heart to the Lord, the God of Israel. And the people said to Joshua, The Lord our God we will serve, and his voice we will obey. Don't think of your life as just being business as usual all the time. There's a lot for you to do. There's unfinished business. And we all need goals. We need to work toward those goals. We need to put those past failures behind us and continue pressing on. Not to ignore or forget the lessons of the past, far from it. We don't want to find ourselves repeating those same mistakes, but putting them away and instead concerning ourselves with what is going on now. Learn from the successes. Don't let them go to waste. Be willing to put some personal plans on hold in order to fulfill God's expectations. If the Israelites had just started planting fields and building houses wherever they found room for it, would they have had success? Would they have conquered the land? Would they have ever become more than just another one of these disparate tribes who were constantly fighting it out and bickering over land allotments throughout the area between the Jordan and the Mediterranean? No. Don't get comfortable with this. Don't get comfortable with the status quo. Don't pretend that your life, as it stands today, is Jesus' final goal for your life. It's not. In Joshua's day, there was an older generation declining that had seen and done a lot of good things. And then the younger generation had to determine whether they would follow in their father's footsteps of making a lot of mistakes along the way, or whether they would maybe fragment off into their own little communities, caring for nothing beyond fulfilling their most basic physical needs and wants. Or were they going to work together in order to please God? Spiritual progress is not made by splintering. Spiritual progress is not made by looking purely at your own needs. Spiritual progress comes when people unite, not just in word, but in deed, for a common cause. If our common cause is the salvation of our souls and the souls of others who still need Christ, we're going to need to work together. We're going to need to put away the foreign gods, the distractions the modern-day idols, and incline our hearts to the Lord. If you want to be part of a community with this intent, then please give River Ridge a look. We're just a group of believers dedicated to serving Christ in our own lives, in our families, in the church, and in the community. His goals are the redemption and purification of each one of us. He wants to transform you and cause you to conform to His image. Will you let Him? You can reach us at 812-550-6234 or info at riverridgechurch.org, or you can find us on Facebook or YouTube to learn more. Please ask us your questions or sign up for a study with me or another of our members. You can also just join us at 5600 Van Road in Newburgh at 9 a.m. Sunday for Bible class and 10 a.m. for worship. We gather again at 4 p.m. on Sundays and 7 p.m. on Wednesdays for another study. I hope to see you there. Thank you for joining me today on Iron Sharpens Iron.